Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, whoever everyone is right now, because of course this is Facebook Live and I really don't know who's there, but I know some, some folks are coming and I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to arrive as we get uh, started on this afternoon's edition of Stories for Healing. Now, as you're starting to discover, um, this is a program that I've put together because I feel, you know, it's really time where we need to be looking at healing. Um, healing in terms of the American elections, you know, a large portion of the population is going to be bitterly disappointed next week, um, no matter what the outcome is. And healing for the world, because we're going through so much right now, so many difficult times, times that I just, I can't remember having gone through um, in my many years on this, on this planet. And while I think it's possible that those of us who have ideas about how things can get better, we should be acting on those ideas. I think really what lies underneath it all is that we need to heal. We need to heal these tremendous divisions that have come between us. And the way we heal is not by me deciding what's best for you and pushing you into doing it, but for me to open up my heart to yours and you to open yours to me. And let us start to listen to each other and understand each other and respect each other, even when we don't agree, because that's the only way we're going to get along. It's the only way we're going to heal the world. Now, the exciting thing about this for me, or one of the most exciting things about this for me, is how quickly it's taken off. I had this idea come to me less than a day ago. And I'll tell you already, already, I've got nearly two dozen storytellers from around the world who've signed up, taken a spot and said, please, please let me tell a story of feeling. So for at least the next two weeks, I thought it would be one week and it, we're already at two, um, twice a day at 2.30 and 8 p.m. Eastern time, there will be this program. It'll be about 15, 20 minutes long, maybe sometimes a little longer. And it'll feature one storyteller, usually, every now and then, maybe two, who will be telling you a story from their tradition or from their heart, from their experience about healing. And my hope is that this will grow in ways that I can't yet predict. But my hope is that we will all start to open our hearts even more to those who are in such need of healing. And by the way, that includes us ourselves, because I know we all need healing in these difficult times. So today, uh, what I'd like to do is tell a story uh, from the Jewish tradition. Now, if you were here yesterday and you heard me tell, you'll know that um, I told two stories from, a, from other traditions, one from the Muslim tradition and one from the Buddhist tradition. But today I wanted to start at least with a story from the Jewish tradition. Now, I know that this story has found its way into other traditions, and I'm not so bold as to claim that this is originally and authentically only a Jewish story because it's one of those that that could span many, many cultures and traditions. However, I think you'll find that the way that this particular story is told makes it uniquely Jewish. But healing is for all of us. So let me put a little Jewish flavor, a little Jewish spice on the story of healing. And the only problem with these stories, especially Jewish stories, is that the title of the story gives away the story. So I, I won't tell you the title of the story. So I want you to sit and imagine for a moment. Imagine, if you will, a large farm a large farm that had been in a family for a very long time. And in this farm, or on this farm, were two main buildings. One was the farmhouse where the family lived. And it sat off to the side a little. And in the center of the farm, there was a hill. 
And on that hill, on the top of that hill, there was a barn. And that's where they stored all the grain that they harvested. And it was a large farm. There was a lot of grain to be stored there. And the family had worked this farm, as I said, for generations. Now, at the time that this story begins, the family consisted of the father. The mother had unfortunately passed away. And two sons, two brothers. Let's call them Moshe and Yunkel. And these two sons, as often happens, didn't exactly get along. They were tolerant of each other at best. They really were on different, different sides of everything. But they were part of the family, so they lived together there with their father and, and worked a farm and worked it hard. As anyone who's worked a farm knows, it's, it's hard, hard labor. And this went on for many years until one day, as happens to all of us, the father died. And that left these two sons, Moshe and Yunkel, with no one else in the house but the two of them. Well, they thought it over. And Moshe, Moshe was ready to get married. He wanted to have children and a big family. And Yunkel, well, he was rather lived by himself. And so the obvious thing to do was to build a second house for Yunkel. And Yunkel built his house as far across the field as he could. And Moshe went out and found a wife, and they began having children. And soon, each of them was settling into a life that they really preferred. Moshe and his family, he loved his family. He loved his family so much. And Yunkel, in his solitude, he appreciated that life as well. Now, did this resolve any of the bad feelings between the two of them? Unfortunately, it didn't. Because you see, now they had no opportunity to interact. They barely saw each other. The only time their paths might cross would be up in the barn. And in fact, their differences just kind of hardened so much that one day they decided they would draw a line down the center of the barn. And all of Moshe's grain would be stored on one side and all of Yunkel's on the other. And that way there would be no fussing and fighting about who was working more or whose crop was doing better. It would be Moshe's over here and Yunkel's over there. And so now they saw each other even less. Because Moshe would go up and he would put his grain in the barn and he'd kind of be sure that Yunkel wasn't around when he was doing that and Yunkel would do the same. And so it continued for a few more years. Moshe's family grew and Yunkel, well, he was even more comfortable in his solitary life. And then one day, who knows why, Moshe was laying in bed, having had a, a wonderful evening with his family. And he thought to himself, you know, I don't really care for Yunkel, but he must be lonely. I mean, he's got no one with him. He's, he spends all his time in his house by himself. I've got so much with my family. Maybe if he had a little bit more, a little more grain to sell, maybe he wouldn't have to work as hard or he could get something that he, he really wants instead of living all by himself. And so a plan hatched for Moshe. And he thought, you know, I'm going to sneak up in the middle of the night when no one's around. And I'm going to move some of the grain from one side of the barn from my side of the barn to his. And I won't have to deal with him, but 
I will have done something good for him and that's, that'll make me feel good. And so that's what he did. The next night, in the middle of the night, he got up and he went up and he moved a fair amount of grain from his side of the barn to the other. Who knows why these things happen? But Yunkel, a few days later, had the same kind of feeling. He thought, here I am. I've got this beautiful house all to myself. There's no obligations to, to take care of anyone else. I've got all the everything I need. And here's my poor brother over there. And he's got a wife and family to feed. He has to work even harder to keep things going. You know, I've got more than enough. Maybe I'll give him some of mine. And so, of course, the same plan approached, appeared to him. And one night in the middle of the night, he went up and he moved some grain from his side of the barn to the other. Now, it wasn't long after that Moshe got up there and he saw that there seemed to be more grain on his side than on his brother's. And he felt like, well, that's not right. And so that night he went up and he moved some more grain over. He moved it over to the, his brother's side, to Yunkel's side, and went back to bed feeling satisfied. And it wasn't long after that that Yunkel got up and he saw that there was far more grain on his side than on his brother's side. So in the middle of the night, he went up and he moved some back. And, and you know how this goes, right? One night, Moshe would move from his side to Yunkel's, and the other night, Yunkel would move from his side to Moshe. And who knows why these things happen? But one night, it just so happened that they both went up there the same night to do the same thing. And all that love that had driven them to that simple act of kindness came rushing back up to the surface for each of them. And they embraced each other and they wept on their necks and they resolved that they would visit each other and let their love for each other be shown more completely. Did they end up agreeing on everything? Of course not. But Moshe and Yunkel would spend time together, whether it was bringing the kids over to Yunkel's house or Yunkel coming over for a big dinner. Now, you might wonder what makes this a Jewish story. Because, as I said, this is told in so many traditions. Well, here it is. The Midrash, that body of work that helps us as Jews understand the more complicated parts of Scripture, the twists and turns of how the world is supposed to run. The Midrash teaches us that that hill, that hill upon which that barn was built, the hill upon which the two brothers finally found each other, is the place where the temple was built, the first and the second. Because where else would we want to build our gateway to the eternal than in the place where two who disliked each other so much that they couldn't live together finally found open hearts and the ability to love each other. And so, my friends, that's what I wish for us. I don't expect or even hope that we'll all agree. As anyone who knows a good Jewish match, there's nothing like agreement that goes on. It's, a, it's this wonderful wrestling match that we have with each other. I wish that for each of us that we find ways of engaging with each other that allows us to hold the strength of our convention and convictions and yet still understand that we're bound together, 
that we care for each other, that we respect each other. I know that I want the best for the world, and I presume that you do too. And we might very well disagree vehemently at times about how that's to be achieved. But if we can remember what it is we're hoping for, what we're drawn to, a better world for all of us, where none of us have to fear, where, as, those other, as another tradition says, the lion can lie down with the lamb, then perhaps if we act on that ourselves, we can new, see new shoots of peace and understanding grow and make our field a very rich field for the years to come. Thank you for joining me today. Um, again, this is going to happen every day at 2.30 in the afternoon and 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, there's, there'll be a different storyteller every day, it looks like, for the next two weeks almost, and, and maybe longer. Um, I invite you, uh, in the, on the page, I'll put the place where we're going to have a YouTube channel of this. So if you've missed these and it's a little hard to search through Facebook, you'll be able to go to a playlist there and see all the previous recordings. Um, I encourage you to leave questions and thoughts and, and encouragements in the chat. Be in touch. Be in touch with each other. Let's work together to help heal ourselves and to heal this broken world. God bless. Mm -hmm.